why don't I just entertain the crowd for a couple of minutes while we try to work through all this. Okay, guys, my name is Sean Carlson. Uh, I uh, am going to be talking to you about how you can use immersions to hopefully solve the science literacy crisis in America. I'm going to start all this again for the benefits of the people who are going to be watching on video at some point in the future. So I'm doing something sort of in advance that is kind of on topic and is fun. Uh, one of the things that we do that I'll be talking about is ways that you can inspire kids to love learning about science by using the, basically the right sales pitch about science, to describe science in language that they really understand that speaks to their immediate self-interest. And so I'm going to give you a couple of examples, but the one I want to talk about today is how we talk about what science is, or what is, what is doing science all about. And we tell kids that doing science is all about making sure you're not fooling yourself. I mean, if you want to have a message that the kids can understand very, very clearly, doing science is all about systematic investigations using experimental methods and falsifiability, but right? And that passes them in both lanes. You want language that's clear and compelling that they understand. Tell them it's all about making sure you're not fooling yourself. Now, I made my living as a professional magician for years. And so what I want to do is I want to do, show you a demonstration of why it's so important. Why do we do uh, systematic observations, right? Because we know that if we don't, something's going to come in and screw up the results and we're going to fool ourselves. Why do we use uh, double-blind controls? Why do we use mathematics to the, to the level and rigor that we do? You know, every single thing that we do is all about making sure you're not fooling yourself. So in order to appreciate just how easy it is to be fooled, I teach all my kids how to do a little bit of magic. Okay, so I need a volunteer, hopefully uh, somebody, a good sport, okay? Not somebody who's gonna give me a bunch of trouble tonight, but a good sport, somebody who's willing to work with me and have fun with me. You, sir, yes, would you please stand right up? Can I have a big round of applause? That's the most credit you got for the least amount of work you've ever done in your life. What's your name? David. David, do me a favor. Sit down right here, David. Okay? And you're going to need to hang on to this. Now, I'm going to show you a classic of magic. Uh, it's, uh, it was originally invented by a vaudevillian made Slide named Slidini. Every magician knows this trick. This is the quintessential example demonstration of, of misdirection. Okay? Every single one of you will see exactly what I am doing. Everyone will see. So don't you know, suddenly scream out an answer or something. Yes, you're all going to see. The only person in the audience who, here tonight who will not see is this gentleman right here. And you're going to sit there and you're going to say, what? Is he stupid or something? Right? That will be your reaction. You may laugh, but don't point. And do thank your lucky stars you don't happen to be sitting right here in this chair. Hey, David, how you doing? All right. We're going to do a little eye test for you. What I want you to do, I'm going to take, roll this up into a ball. And what I want you to do is see if you can watch the ball very, very carefully. Don't take your eyes off the ball. Oh, yes, that's very good. Now, what I want you to do is see if you can tell which hand I put the ball in. Okay. Watch, one, two, which hand is the ball? No, 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 you're not watching very close. Well, let's try it one more time. Watch, one, two, three, which hand is the ball? This one. <laughs> okay, okay, two out of three, you ready? One last time, now which hand is the ball? Today would be nice. Neither. Which hand has the ball? Which one? There, da, da. Uh, and no, no, actually, you, you were right the first time. It was neither. Let's try the one more time. Okay, now we're going to do that again in slow motion, all right? What I want you to do is one, two, three, blow. No, 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 you're not blowing hard enough. One more time. Blow really hard. And just that fast, oh, it disappears. <laughs> now I'm going to do this in super slow motion. You ready? Watch. Take the ball, place it right there. Now watch. One, two, three. J 
just that fast. <laughs> Disappears. Now, one last time here. Now, I'm going to take a really big ball, an absolutely enormous ball, a ball of paper so large I can't even hold it in my hand completely without him seeing it. Are you ready? Now, I want to see if I can make this, this, this ball disappear. That's right. Keep your eyes. Very good. A lot, a lot of times when I'm talking to people, they look up at me just like that. And if you do that, I'm going to fool you. Don't look up at me. Keep your eyes on the ball. Are you ready? One last time. One, two, three. Blow. Has it disappeared yet? Do you know why it hasn't disappeared? Because it's too big. Now watch. Blow. Can I have a big hand of applause, big round of applause for David? Very good. Very good. Are we up? Aha, I distracted you long enough. Now the question is, can I go through my slides? Yes! OK, we're done. We're set. His first career was as a, magi a magician. He, from the age of 16 to 18, he earned his living as a street magician, doing mainly a trick called Three Card Monty. Well, Three Card Monty was one of the things. One I did. Of the three Card Monty is illegal gambling. I'm not supposed to talk about that. <laughs> I did do that. I did a lot of things in the streets that I'm not supposed to talk about anymore. But uh, no, it was uh, 18 until about uh, 21. I made my living as a street magician. So after that, he was undergraduate at UCLA. Berkeley. Berkeley. And got his PhD at? Yeah, UCLA. UCLA. <laughs> a few years, then he did a postdoc. We haven't Berkeley. rehearsed this, can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> supervisor did not see totally eye to eye on what Sean should be doing. And Sean then decided to launch himself on a new career, becoming engaged with science education. He had an absolutely spectacular idea of organizing the tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, people in the U.S. who wanted to be citizen scientists, who wanted to be capable of doing experiments on their own, in teams, whatever, connect to one another. He formed the Society for Amateur Scientists, right? Yes. I'm doing all of this from memory, as you can tell. Formed the science, and this was a major emerging institution. It's very much alive today. It's all due to Sean. And this extraordinary development in the field of science education was recognized by the MacArthur people who gave him one of their genius awards. Uh, not content to rest on his laurels, Sean then took on an even harder problem organization of being a catalyst of, start, of a new initiative in science education. And that is to find a way of teach, reaching middle schoolers, starting with middle schoolers, but running from age 11 to 17. He started a program called the Lab Rats Science Education Program. And in part of his talk tonight, he'll tell you about that. So I will say no more about that, but I'll introduce a great magician, a great teacher, and a great innovator, Sean Carlson. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the thing I hate about introductions is trying to live up to them. I'd much rather somebody, yeah, I found this guy in the street, and he seemed to have some interesting ideas, so I thought I'd drag him in front of you. 
uh, is, is, is kind of like sets me up for where I'd rather be. But today I am going to be talking to you about what I think is a really great idea for how we might be able to solve the very, the very, uh, the very difficult to solve problem of science literacy in the United States and talk about my ideas for an emergent approach to solving the science literacy crisis. The problem, of course, is the moment that you say an emergent approach to solving the science literacy crisis, <clears throat> most people are going to ask, well, which science literacy crisis are you talking about? Are you talking about the science literacy crisis like so many people in the United States don't even have a basic understanding of how long it takes for the Earth to go around? Or are you talking about the science literacy crisis that we are, that more than 50% of our working PhDs in, in math and science in this country are foreign imports? They're people who we brought in from outside because we're not producing enough scientists and technologists in this country to solve the problems that we have right now? Should we be producing more scientists? Or should we be trying to create a more science, science literate society? And the first, before you can even try to solve the question, you have to agree on what it is that you're trying to do. And those two camps have been at war for a long time, which is in part why it's one of the reasons why it's been hard for us to solve the problem. And I have to tell you, I used to be a warrior in that battle. I felt very strongly that we had to work to create more scientists. And Thanks to this guy, a year ago, he, taught, he taught me about emergence. And in the last year, the concepts behind emergence have really totally transformed my thinking about science, about physics, and also about how to solve problems in the world around us. And so I want to first propose that by, by trying to do it one way or the other, what we're doing is trying to force human beings to be a particular way. Right? We are trying to take flesh and blood. Each camp is trying to decide how we can take the population of the United States and squeeze them together to produce a particular result. And as all of you know, when you do that, usually the harder you squeeze, the more rapidly the results you're trying to produce turns into powder in front of your hands. Right? And so what we need to do, instead of asking which result in the future are we trying to force, science literacy or more science and technologists, we need to think about it from a more emergent perspective. So instead of trying, I mean, emergence tends to be you throw, you create the ingredients together, you bring the things together, and a solution is created that is greater than you ever could have thought of. Am I right? Because I got to tell you, I'm pretty ignorant. My imagination is very limited compared to the great potential that is out there if everyone is starting to work on this problem on their own in, in a facilitated way. And so I think that what we ought to do is start thinking about uh, th that our goal should be, let's try to come up with a system whereby each child is given the power to, uh, to uh, develop into their own personal best destiny, to achieve their own personal best destiny. Okay? If you do that, I believe you're going to have a higher, I mean, a much better future than you will if you're trying to solve the problem with a rigorous idea about what the solution is going to look, to, to look like. Does that make sense? So can I get an amen? amen. All right. Uh, so what I want to do is talk about how we could go about uh, making that happen. And to do that, you have to go back to basic human psychology. People, what we want to do is create people who are prepared for success in whatever field they happen to be interested in. And success, uh, when it's been studied, successful people have been, have been studied by psychologists and sociologists, they've identified three major personality characteristics that I like to call the three C's. The first is capacity. The ability, raw smarts. The ability to actually do the work because you have, you know, you have enough mental calculation. I do not believe that it's possible to teach quantum mechanics to a dog. Okay? I don't think dogs are smart enough to learn quantum mechanics. Now, if you uh, want to ask the question, how smart does someone have to be to be science literate, depending on what your definition is, when I ask most people that question, I, most people say, well, 
of average intelligence, I would say. I think somebody who is of average intelligence can learn to be science literate. How many of you would agree with that statement? Huh? Average intelligence? Well, if you say of average intelligence, you've just knocked out 50% of the population, right? Because 50% of the population is below average intelligence. All right, so the idea of achieving universal science literacy right there starts to sound a little dodgy when you're already cutting out half the people. So you have to find people who have the raw smarts. The other thing you have to do is ha ha the people who are going to uh, achieve have to have the commitment, the fire in the belly to overcome any and all obstacles. I guess who has the greater commitment in this, you know, in this, in this image? I think it's the zebra because he had to build that motorcycle himself. But, um, and commitment is something, fire in the belly is something that does not come naturally. Those of you here all have it. But there are a lot of people out there who don't. Okay, and so if it comes naturally to you, you think, well, it must be natural to everyone. And in fact, you guys are more the exception than the rule. Okay, and the last one is community. We all have to have a nurturing community that rewards our success and that carries us forwards. No one is an island. We can't succeed all by ourselves, all right? Every single person in this room who is successful can point to somebody who was a mentor, who believed in them, and gave them encouragement at the appropriate time. Am I right? So all of us who want to be involved in solving, in solving this problem, when we work with young people, we are all a member of their community. All right? And that's how you can get, part, partly how you can get involved. Now, there are a couple of two main different kinds of communities, and these are examples of communities that we can be involved with. Schools, science clubs, sports, and this is a, is a, a positive family community. The thing about these that lead to success is that they are not only nurturing the person to be the best that they can be, but they're also connecting them to the greater community. Their focus is outwards from themselves to the greater community, the, the, the world out there. You should use your talents and your, and your capabilities to go out and make a difference in the world. That's the lesson of all the communities that are positive. But there is another class of community. Now first, if you are uh, uh, in that kind of community, the results can be absolutely staggering. Okay, we, we, and nothing, almost nothing cannot be achieved. That was a bad double negative, which I will never repeat again. But there are other kinds of communities as well. And these communities, not so positive, okay? What's the difference? These communities tend to be ones that focus inwards. It's all about us versus them, okay? And they are not us, okay? And when you have this strong separation between us and them, you get a lot of incredible ego invested, but the result is rarely positive. This is a picture of, and, and, and far worse than this. I mean, this is a slap and a tickle compared to what happens to some people who, got, who cross gangs. This girl was tortured for 90 minutes by 10 16-year-old girls, okay, who are members of a gang because she committed, committed some offense. And so the question is, between the way uh, young people grow up and the values that they take depends very much on whether they're thinking, they're turned to think about the greater world beyond them or being very selfish and thinking about themselves and only their own group. And so the community makes all the difference. So if you're going to be a member of the community, you're going to make a positive influence on kids, uh, what do you have to do? Well, you have to cultivate hero worship. I'm not making that up. And if that bothers you, get over it, because that's what you have to do. You must, if you're going to be involved in the kids' lives, they have to look up to you. They have to admire you. They have to respect you. And they, want, they have to want to be like you if you're going to be able to have a positive, life-changing influence on these kids. So you have to think about being a hero. Now, there are lots of different, no, it doesn't stop with kids, but we're talking about, about kids right now. I can digress if you'd like. Anyway, um, so there are lots of different 
uh, community heroes that we know already. You know, uh, 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 mothers who are coaching uh, T-ball, we've got, uh, you know, teachers and Boy Scout leaders and religious leaders. And at this point, I want to talk to you about the, what's, well, hold on. I want to bring up the point that, that the, w the reason why these people are heroes is because they do two things. They engage the children in activities that the kids enjoy. They become part of their lives through engaging, being with them. And secondly, they emphasize character. Okay, they hold themselves to a high standard of character, and they demand that the young people also hold themselves to high standards of character. And I want to emphasize that there's a difference between ethics and morality here. Okay? Ethics is how we deal with each other ethically. Okay, what are the rules that we obey? What are our attitudes about how we're going to deal with each other? Give, share, contribute, all those sort of things. Morality is what you do when nobody's looking. All right? Now, the question, it, for instance, should a young person abstain from sex until they get married, that's a moral choice. And that's a choice that has to do with the family. And if the family wants to bring the person to a religious leader to talk about it, that's their business. That's a very intimate sphere. All right? But, and I do not believe that us, anybody outside of the nuclear family, should try to get involved in moral questions. But ethics, yeah, is something that we can very strongly, we can very strongly promote. Let me ask you something. Um, of these groups, of the people you see up there, for the people who come from very unfortunate circumstances and go up to be wild, grow up to be wild successes, after parents, who do they cite as being the number one positive influence in their lives? How many say teachers? I heard a couple of people say teachers. How many people say religious leaders? Not a hand goes up. That tells me a lot about this audience. Uh, what community you're in. Yeah, scouting social organizations. Uh, coaches. The answer is coaches. It's coaches. And the reason why is science teachers, for the most part, are focused on teaching fact. Coaches teach character. They teach teamwork. They teach success in sport as a metaphor for success in life. There is absolutely no reason why we can't do that in the science class. I mean, if you think about it, you know, just five years after you get off the court, how useful is it to be able to take a basketball and throw it through a hoop that's 30 feet away and 10 feet up. How many times does that come up in your daily life, right? Ah, too often. But if you understand how science works, how the natural world works, if you understand how to think scientifically and solve problems, that's extremely relevant to you every day of your life. Okay, so what we teach in science is every bit as relevant, if not more relevant, from what the, from, than what they teach in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, on the field. But we don't have the coaching culture in the classroom, and that's something that we can have, and I think that we should change. Okay. All right. Now, how do you hook kids into being lifelong learners? If we want to create a community experience where, in addition to them imprinting on us, we want them to learn stuff through us. The fact of the matter is, learning follows interest. If you take a kid who is not yet interested in some material and force them through a classroom, well, maybe they'll be able to regurgitate the material enough at the end to be able to pass the test. But you think they're going to remember it five years from now, 10 years from now? How many people took a class, maybe recently, that you absolutely hated? Ever taken a class that you did not want to take? Oh, come on. Be brave. Come on, put your hands up. I did. OK, I took, um, I, I took economics and hated it. And today, about the only thing I remember from my economics class is supply and demand. And that's about it, OK? If we're not in the business of teaching kids stuff to pass tests, we're in the business of giving them real working information that they get to carry with them out into their lives and access anytime they need it for the rest of their lives. Am I right? Okay, and so if you 
teach kids something and they only remember it for the test, they don't remember it a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, you've wasted your time, you've wasted their time, and you've wasted the taxpayer's money. So it is very, very important that we learn to cultivate interest. All right? And how do you do that? Well, the number one, there are several ways. The number one way is to engage them. So now we come back for, for engagement. Get them involved in an activity that they get their hands on, that they see other people around who are passionate about. That passion is, can, is infectious. So get them engaged in something that's, that, that, they're passionate about, that you're passionate about. Um, I have to tell you, there are many people who will say, for instance, you know, I'm an amateur ornithologist now. I like birds. I'm a bird watcher. I'm an avid bird watcher. And didn't think at all about bird watching until I got into high school biology. And my high school teacher, he really loved birds. And he was so excited about birds that somehow that excitement got into the classroom. And a number of us went out and actually started, started doing something that we had never thought of before. As a matter of fact, that's how most amateur scientists become amateur scientists and how many professional scientists become professional scientists. They worked with someone in school or someplace else who had a passion for a, sub for a subject and their passion was transmitted. That only comes through engagement. All right, so how do we engage kids to love learning about science? <laughs> Greed. I love this picture. <laughs> this is like the best picture of avarice I've ever seen. What do you think that little girl would be willing to do for one more dog? <laughs> when I say greed, I mean you have to answer the what's in it for me question. If you are eight years old and you're being taught by a teacher and the teacher says, let me show you this really neat math thing. The eight year old almost always goes, yes, show me the really neat math thing. Okay, but then when you're in eighth grade, and you're stepping into your first day of eighth grade algebra, what's the number one question eighth grade algebra teachers get on the first day of school? Will I ever need this? Why am I here? What's in this for me? Right? Suppose I were to walk up to, no, David, I've already picked on you. You, yes, sir. What's your name? Jordan. Jordan. Give me $10. My wallet is in my other pants. Ah! If I walk up to somebody and say, I'd like you to give me $10, I'll always get a result like that, an uh, a result like that, won't I? Okay, and the reason why is I haven't given Jordan a reason for why he should give me $10. Now, Jordan, I'm holding in my hands, oh, if I could only hold this in my hands, um, a single share of Apple stock. And I will trade you this piece of paper for your piece of paper. Would you do it then? What's my piece of paper? My $10. Your, your $10. I'd be foolish not to. Yeah, I'd be foolish not to, right? If I make the value proposition high enough for him, he'll say yes every time. OK, so when the kids are asking what's in it for me, they're asking the adult question. Puberty has come in and hit them on the head and changed their focus from I want to learn more about the world to I'm much more concerned about my position in the social strata. Now I got to know what's in it for me. Okay, So we have to be able to answer that question. And to do that, you have to appeal to uh, immediate self-interest. OK, so uh, let me tell you what happens in that eighth grade classroom. Usually the teacher will say, well, you know, two years from now when you graduate from junior high school, actually I guess this would be a sixth grade classroom, four years after that when you graduate from high school, and four years after that when you finally graduate from college, there are people today who believe that some of what you're learning in this class right now might possibly be useful, you to, useful to you in some future career you haven't even decided on yet. That's not such a powerful con argument, right? Because kids can't think 10 years from now. Because 10 years ago, they were four, <laughs> right? They have no concept of what the adult world is like. I'm not saying you don't make that argument. That has to be part of, of their thinking. But that argument is not sufficient to create the fire in the belly that it takes to get kids to do the hard work that's necessary to master this material. So instead, 
What you have to do is pretend that you're selling science. Learn to take a lesson from the marketeers. You have to make an emotional connection to these kids by describing science and the benefits in a way that plays to their immediate self-interest. For instance, when you ask, you know, why should I study science? What we do is we say, because an education in science and technology is nothing less than the power to transform the entire world with a single idea. Is that right? A lot more inspirational than, hey, ten years from now, maybe somebody will uh, pay you to load this stuff. Right? You put it in very dramatic, emotionally charged language. And then you prove that this is true. And you say, look, I'm not saying everybody is going to be an Einstein. But I am telling you that every single thing you see, every single circuit in your, in your cell phone, every bit of technology that you have, uh, everything in the world around you was designed by somebody. And people all around the world, there are hundreds of thousands of people who are educated in science and technology, who can go to bed every night saying, I made a difference. I helped change the world. That's true of most scientists can say that. Okay? And if you'd like to be able to go to bed every night and say, I'm making a difference, my work is changing the world. If you'd like to have that kind of immortality, you may die, your main name may die, but your work and your genius lives on, helping other people after your life is over. That sounds like that's something that you'd like to do. Then you've got to buckle down and learn science and learn a little bit about science and technology. So we point this out, and then I ask them, do you want that power? You personally. And that's often the first time they've ever thought about maybe themselves personally having that power. Most kids, not all, most kids will say yes. And then you have to hit them up. Since they said yes, you got to hit them with the immediate upsell. Are you willing to work your butt off to get it? Now, if they've already said yes, they're almost certain to say yes to the second question. I am not a fan of trying to sell science as fun. Science is fun. Right? There's this new movement. We're trying to pay. Science is fun. Anybody who has an education knows in, who, in science knows it isn't always fun. Right? You're sitting there waiting, you know, preparing for your oral exam. You're standing out there with the professors inside about to call your name. Believe me, you are not having fun. Okay? Okay? Science is hard. Every single one of us who is educated in science are educated because we worked our butts off no matter how gifted we naturally were in the subject. Okay? And you have to prepare kids for the hard work. If the only people you inspire to come learn science under your tent are the kids who are looking to have fun, sometimes I get a little animated those things happen. Uh, the kids who are looking to have fun, what's going to happen is the kids who you're going to get are going to be the ones who are going to abandon you the moment they realize that there's a lot of hard work involved. All right? So whatever you do, don't tell them that science is fun. And don't drop this in the middle of a show. All right, so you have to prepare them for the hard work. Okay, now the other thing that we talk about, as I, I did, uh, did the demonstration for you earlier about sciences, doing science is all about making sure you're not fooling yourself. And if the reason why that's very powerful is because A, kids can understand it immediately, and they know that if you're making sure you're not fooling yourself, then you're less likely to be fooled. And that's going to give you a tremendous advantage in life over everybody out there which is most people who are not, who do not know how to be careful enough to make sure they're not fooling themselves. So they can see that that gives them an immediate advantage. And there are a number of other things that we also do. Okay? Um, of course, you've all heard about the importance of making things uh, 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 relevant. I'm going to burn through this a little faster because I don't want to run out of time too quickly since we started a little late. But basically, in the program I created, Lab Rats, we divide science up into three things. Rules, tools, and tools. So the rules are rules of thumb. Numbers that most scientists carry around in their heads that help them set the scale of creation. The atom is about an angstrom. Okay, the distance from the Earth to the sun is about eight light minutes. Right? Speed of light, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. 
these rules of thumb that we use to calibrate the world around us. So if we see some new phenomena, we immediately know where it fits on the hierarchy of the scale of creation. All right? Tools are the practical techniques we actually use to solve real problems. You know, the, like simple uh, formulas that we use all the time. Like if we want to figure out how long a cow could live if it stood out in a blizzard at 30 degrees, the, a mathematician would solve the problem by saying, well, assume a spherical cow, <laughs> right? Because that's the problem that they can actually solve for heat transfer, right? So the practical tools, drawing pictures, all those other things. And finally, jewels, and I call these jewels because I needed something that rhymed with rules and tools. <laughs> the jewel concepts are foundational ideas that once you get them, they apply to so many different systems that the entire universe gets smaller. For instance, the idea of um, exponential growth, that if the rate of growth is, if feeds back, I'm sorry, that if the size of the thing feeds back into its rate of growth, that it blows up exponentially. So an avalanche, you know, at first it's a little bit of snow, and then that knocks down an equal amount of snow, and then the next instant you got two units going, and then the next thing you got four units going, but da 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 In a matter of seconds, you have a million metric tons of ice and snow hurtling down the mountainside, destroying everybody in its path, destroying everything in its path, okay? That idea of runaway growth happens anywhere you see something that takes off and rails, okay, and goes off, like supernova explosions and, and pothole growth and the rate at which people go onto a dance floor. All of these things are governed by that rule, okay? So if you understand that rule, suddenly the entire universe gets a little bit smaller. And once you know about 100 of these, the universe sort of sits at a ball in front of your head. And you may not know everything there is to know about it, but you have the confidence that anything in it that you want to learn about, you have enough of a background to be able to master any subject. Okay, when you reach that, you are truly science literate. Right? And by breaking it up into about 100 jewels or so, rules and tools, uh, I think this is the fast track to, to trying to get kids to be able to use science. Now probably, I mean the reason why the jewels are great is because they give you this strong emotional upwelling when you suddenly get them, right? I mean you've had an epiphany, right? It's literally an epiphany. You suddenly realize something and you go, aha, I get it. And it's great to try to get kids addicted to that sense of, yes, I get it. And probably the single most important idea that I know about, because it has the widest degree of application, and it's now the central uh, concept that we teach lab rats around, is emergence. So basically, and I don't need to tell you guys about emergence, you're studying the subject, but it's how you can take a bunch of cups of Starbucks coffee and put them together to make the Mona Lisa. How is it that things, right, are greater than the sum of their parts, can be greater than the sum of, sum of their parts? And, of course, emergence is, is everywhere. Um, you can start with simple Newtonian mechanics and think about a spring and a mass. Separately, they do what they do, which is not particularly interesting. And then you connect the spring to the mass, and you draw a box around the spring and the mass, and suddenly you get something you could probably never have guessed had you not actually seen it, simple harmonic motion. A new phenomena that exists solely because you bring these two things together. It's all throughout Newtonian mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, which gives you chemistry, at every step from chemistry to organic molecules, from organic molecules, uh, molecules to simple life, to complex life, to humans, to 100 billion brain cells turning into intelligence, to finally the culture and the things that we do. At every step through here, you can keep bringing kids back to this concept of emergence. I know of no other physical concept in science that is, why, that is as true or as applicable in as many, different, as many different systems in so powerful a way to give you new insight into the way things work. So that's why... I'm really big on emergence. You did it to me. <laughs> so since the science literacy issue, getting people inspired to become uh, great, um, uh, to, to achieve their own personal best destiny is an emergent problem, I think it needs an emergent approach to its solution. And what I, I call this 360 degree engagement, and by which I mean you want everybody who can be involved to be involved. So 
it turns out that in, in a, beyond just the teachers, there are hundreds of thousands of working scientists, millions of parents. Did you know that 82% of all parents, even those from the lowest economic backgrounds, if you ask them, if you could do more to help your kids master science, 82, would you? 82% say yes. I just don't know how to do it. Okay, well, that's a huge potential group to go out and organize and to turn into foot soldiers to help make this happen. There are lots of retired scientists, engineers, technologists, and of course, I didn't have anyone in particular who had given us a lot of money, so I just thought I'd pull this guy out of history to represent philanthropy in general, okay? But, and also philanthropists who care deeply about the problem. And what you wanna do is you wanna bring them all together and give them a way that they can contribute in a way that they know is going to solve the problem now, or uh, uh, address the problem. The problem is that they're doing that now, but they're doing it very inefficiently. They're throwing resources out in every direction, putting out whatever fire seems to be in front of them. But if you can actually organize the teachers and the working scientists and all the rest of these groups by giving them a single hub program, something that can stand in the center, that they can go and network with and know that their work, their effort, their energies is going to make a difference, then you've got something. And that was what we designed Lab Rats to be. The Lab Rats Science Education Program was designed to be an example of a hub program, not the only one, okay, but one that we think could reach a lot of kids. Um, basically, uh, to summarize Lab Rats very quickly, um, you can think of it sort of as Boy Scouts for kids who like science and boys and girls who like science. Uh, we focus, they have weekly meetings that go throughout their teenage years so the kids get a steady regular influence throughout their, uh, their teens um, which, because it takes that kind of long-term focus to make a difference in their lives. Uh, every activity provides an immediate payoff. Uh, I told you about the rules, tools, and tool and jewels. Uh, they have a merit-based system advancement so that the more, they, the more they learn, the more they contribute back to society and to the organization. The higher up in rank they go and the more social status they gain. Uh, we have a very strong ethical code that we uh, enforce. Uh, our uh, groups are led by professional educators that we call synergy leaders and not just volunteers uh, because it takes a special expertise to be able to teach our program. And uh, we bring in community science mentors to help with the merit badges and other efforts that they need to be able to advance. And we work with um, all sorts of other science education programs, first robotics and, and so on, um, to get them involved. I'm not gonna tell you about I Do Science, although it's super cool. Um, and um, our goal is to create Lab Rats to be a national organization so that when somebody moves, they can immediately pro uh, move back into the, the, no matter where they move in the country, they can immediately plug back into the same program, be in the same rank, have the same level of respect, social respect, and so forth. Um, the military has told us that they're very interested in having us put a lab rats program on every base. They like the scouting model. It fits in very well with the way that they like to do things. And the Boys and Girls Club tell us that when we've proven that lab rats works in their groups locally, they'll help us, may, uh, 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 it'll help us run nationally. So the way you get this whole thing to be emergent, you can sit there and you can argue and you can say, well, this isn't really an emergent model, right? I mean, you're organizing all these people to achieve your vision, right? That's not really so emergent. Well, my point is Labras is just one example of the kind of hub program that you can have. I hope some of you, as you go up and go out into the world, will come up with similar programs that appeal to things that you, the, the way you think things should be done. And then we all duke it out in the marketplace and share uh, share ideas and share resources, and that's when this really becomes an emergent solution that can reach, okay, that can reach everybody. Lab rats can reach a lot of people, but we can't do the job entirely by, our, by ourselves. Okay, I'm not going to tell you too much about uh, this because we're out of time. Okay, we all know, this is my ending slide, so let me, let me give you my picture. We all know that the future is emergent. And my view is that, as I hope I've convinced you, if we're really going to have a fighting chance to address these social issues, emergence must also be part of our future. All right. Thank you very much.
engaged in what you've been hearing, we could have another 30 or 40 minutes of discussion. So I'll open the uh, group to questions, and I'll sit down and let Sean deal with them. OK, anybody got any questions, concerns, complaints? Those you can take it from there. Yes, David. So, yeah, Erwin. So, um, is, is the lab at Furman meant to compete with Voice Gap then? Or is, would I do they kind of coexist? Because, well, I mean, I take, you know, imagine you have a parent who's deciding what program to put their kids sure. in, you know, well, schedule. Well, my goal is not to compete with Boy Scouts. I was an Eagle Scout. Uh, I got kicked out of my house when I was 16, and the Boy Scouts basically saved me. I got the, the, the uh, training and the ethics that I got from that program. And I was also the only non-Jew in all Jewish Boy Scout troop, so when I got kicked out, I had 30 Jewish mothers to take care of, <laughs> which was really important. So we're not trying to compete openly. For one thing, we don't, most of the kids who join Boy Scouts are not doing it because they're looking for STEM education, right? They're doing it for a different reason. Fully 50% of the kids who are 18 when they graduate from Scouts go into the military. Okay, so they're appealing to, uh, to a different, to a different uh, demographic, and that's great. So what we're trying to do is take those social elements of the Boy Scouts that work so well at binding kids emotionally to a group and apply those to teaching science and technology instead of campfires and sprinklers. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sorry. Um, does does lab rats uh, or do you does lab rats prepare kids or do you see lab rats as at some point preparing kids to, to not only be scientists themselves but uh, engage their peers who didn't participate in lab rats. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Our, I mean, our view is that kids in lab rats become evangelists for science, mm -hmm. for science education. And they take their enthusiasm with them back to their schools, and whatever happens is emergent, right? Whatever happens, happens. And we expect that, that uh, data will show over time that they have a positive influence in inspiring other kids to also uh, get more interested in science. I can't prove that, but I, I suspect that will be true, and we'll just have to have to get the data to find out. But yeah, I think it can can be a tide that lifts many boats. So I was interested. You said one of those sort of sales pitches is so you, so you're not fooling yourself. And I've often sort of pitched it more as so you know others don't take advantage of you or you don't get sold stupid stuff and, or the, you know at least these are the reasons you might sure. want to. None of the stuff is somebody doesn't take advantage of you, or you know, yeah, yeah. somebody's not fooling you. Yeah, exactly. So. There's, a, there's actually a subtlety that you, you just hit on. Because it's like, the fact of the matter is, most of us, the, the great fooling in the world is mostly us fooling ourselves. It's only if we have fooled ourselves into believing certain things are possible that other people can then fool us. Okay, but your point is very well taken. The, 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 the defense against being fooled is more of a hard edge kind of skeptical approach that the skeptics take, the skeptic movement takes. So I try to say, well, we're empiricists, and empiricists are people who always, I mean, the one difference between a scientist and everybody else, if you had to pick one thing that's a difference, it's that scientists make the conscious realization that they, that if they are presented evidence, about a belief that they hold. It does not matter how dearly they hold that belief. If the evidence shows that belief is wrong, they will change their beliefs to fit the data. They will not change their interpretation of the data to fit their beliefs. 99% of people consistently, almost universally, change their perception of the data to fit their a priori belief. Okay? And the scientist is the one who says, I don't care how painful it is. I will always follow the data. That's the single most difficult thing to do, to be a scientist. And most scientists don't do it 100% of the time. Okay? And so that's, that's sort of the approach that we take. Um, we may fold in the more skeptics angle. The skeptics, I'm, big, I'm you know, friends with the, with the skeptics groups. Um, and they, we may fold in that more. But right now we're sort of staying away because we see that as more or less as their, their call to action. I was just thinking for the young young audience and when they're like in 13 or something, you know, one might not think of ever fooling, you know, you might not think sort of fooling, you know, this is the point that I'm even at 13 fooling myself, but 
Yeah, but you see, what, that's why we do magic. We teach them magic. Because what they do is they learn a math. They learn how to do magic themselves. And then they go out and they realize just how easy it is to fool my father. He actually thought this self-working trick was an example of mental telepathy. I could You know, and the fact of the matter is when they realize just how easy it is for them to fool others, and I show them how easy it is for me to fool you, then they begin to realize how easy it is for them to be fooled, and we emphasize this argument about how many people fool themselves. And everybody could always think of examples of someone else doing that, right? But we try to get them to see them doing that in their own lives. And that's what we've had some success at. So, I mean, I'm not saying we don't, but yeah, you're I'm not sure making an excellent true. point, because you are making an excellent point, um, but this is the tact that we decided to take at this time. Any other questions? Sorry. Yeah, um, I have two of them. The, the first one leads into the second one, but the this lab rats program is it? I guess the first one is who who do you actually work for to make this lab rats program? Is this an NSF thing? Is this a federal thing that is kind of being put out there trying to be made? So there's a lot of different groups that are working on this collaboratively. I guess I don't understand exactly where this comes from. We applied for NSF money, and okay. the NSF gave us an answer that I thought was really interesting. Because we said that we were going to try to create a national program. And the NSF said, well, no one's ever created a national youth program around science. And so since we're a conservative science organization that only funds things that we think have the high probability of success, yes, you've got a great team, yes, you've got a great vision, yes, it's based on the national model of Boy Scouts, which works, but we won't fund you because there is no model that we can use to show that what you're doing can be done on a national basis. And my answer was, oh, so you'll fund the second lab rats group, right? After, after we prove without any seed money that the impossible can actually, in fact, be done. I mean, I keep saying, if you're going to solve the science literacy crisis, you have to do something nobody's ever done before. Otherwise, you're not going to solve the problem. Um, so, uh, so we did not get money from the National Science Foundation, and I haven't gone back to them. So this has been... Uh, individuals, uh, uh, some corporate uh, support, uh, and me working a lot for free, which is what it's been to, to, to move it forward. So that's usually what it takes, is somebody with a vision to sit down and not care how much they starve their children. Huh. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, you had a yeah, second? Yeah, so the second one was, both my, um, both my parents are teachers. Yes. Um, one, they're, they're not in STEM. One of them is a primary school teacher, and the other one is a music teacher. But... I've gotten a lot of, I've been in a lot of discussions with them on the federal mandates on education right yeah. now. So this was kind of more along the lines of how involved or how much knowledge do you have and how much this butts heads with what the federal government said or what state governments say, you have to meet this criteria for science, math, technology, whatever. And if you don't make, if you don't make them, we're not going to give you money. Because it happens all the time and it drives my parents crazy. Yeah, that well, that the, the thing is that those standards are more about people doing CYA than actually doing real science. I, I agree. The, I mean, really? the fact of the matter is, I don't care what I do, anything I do, I can show you how it fits the standards. Because the standards are so broad and amorphous that, you know, I, I have this strong ethical thing against doing that. But, but, and a lot of people don't, which is why they tend to get a lot of money. <laughs> so, and I was, so I was kind of wondering, do you, since you're, you're in it right now, yeah. you're, you're in the, the midst of it, do you have kind of a dowsing rod that gives you a feeling as to how this kind of stuff is going compared to, I guess, the past 10 years of science education, which has been straight to a state-driven test for mandates? So you know, this is, 50 years, if you want to go back as far as we've been trying to solve the problem using yeah. conventional means. And, uh, where, where we sit with that. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. remarkable thing about the government is, is when something has not worked, they never say, we have to stop and do something completely different. They say, well, we're going to keep doing what we've been doing yeah. harder, faster, and deeper. Right. right? And so that's... that's no the, child left no, no child left untested, yeah. Um, and so, I mean, the, the point of the matter is we are not trying to uh, supplant the, the standards. We are trying to outcompete. So we're just trying to create a program that exists outside the schools, works with the schools, but is not restricted to the state curriculum. Because I think that if you teach in the rules, tools, and jewels, that whatever your curriculum is, 
the kids who understand that stuff will be able to learn it better, more efficiently than... It's, it's an addendum to what they do inside the class time. Yeah. So, like an after-school program. <coughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. An after-school program is, is usually an evening program. Yeah. It's coming together in the, in, a, in the evening to take part of this once a week. So, so that's, that's what we try to do. So I've been learning a little bit about um, presenting science through like model-based reasoning. Yes, yes. Do they, does, does the program kind of try to use that approach a little bit, even in these after-school programs, where they kind of, it's more, I, from what I understand, it's basically, rather, they just, it's more of a discovery for uh, Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, the, the thing you have to understand is, is there is no free discovery right. that doesn't work. Okay? If, if somebody wants to say, well, we're going to do hands-on activities and the kids are going to discover the curriculum, they have to realize it took many thousands of brilliant men and women, 250 years, to figure out our current model of the universe. Okay? And so if you think that you're going to have a bunch of 12-year-olds in the course of one semester sort of recreate the reasoning without a lot of guidance from people who know where they're going, you're being unrealistic. Uh, it's got to be scaffolded. Yes. So, so, so basically, yeah, I mean, we do that. We do a lot of, of, of guided things. We know where they're going. We let them have the illusion that they're going there all by themselves. But if they're going too far in the other direction, we do not let them waste a lot of time going in a direction that we know is not going to be profitable. But then, also, if somebody comes up with something original, we make sure that we can recognize that, that this is a new approach. For instance, one of the things that we do is we, I love to, to teach kids about math, how to, how, why they should love math. And it's because most kids think that math is all about arithmetic. Okay? It's all about adding. They don't realize that math is not hard. Math is actually easy. And if you're doing it and it's hard, it's because you're not doing it the right way. I mean, the reason why math is useful is because it makes the impossible trivial, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't do, use it for anything. So what I, what I like to do is give them a very famous problem. I say, okay, suppose you had to add up all the numbers from 1 to 100, and you didn't have a spreadsheet, okay? How would you do it? Do you think you could do it? Most people say, oh, yeah, you know, I could write down and add them up. And I say, okay, so after you added up that column of numbers, how would you know you were right? And they say, well, I could do it again. And I say, okay, suppose you do it again and you get a different answer. Which answer is the right one? Suppose you do it again and get the same answer. How can you be certain you didn't make the same mistake? Because if when you're adding 67 plus 68 plus 69, you make a single mistake, your answer is as wrong as if you've made 100 mistakes. And I said, that's because you're thinking about the problem mathematically. Or I was thinking about the problem from a standpoint of arithmetic. But if you think about it mathematically, there's a way to add the numbers in seconds in your head and be as certain of the answer as you are of your own name. Okay? That's a pretty challenging thing. But I guide them to realize that some numbers are easier to add than others. And the problem is difficult because they happen to add them in the order in which they are presented them. Okay? But you can add numbers in any order you want. So I get them to realize that, I get them to to, to realize that if they add hundreds, that's really easy. Hundreds are really easy to yeah. add. So then we find out where the hundreds are. Well, 1 and 99 is 100, and 2 and 98 is 100, and 3 and 97 is 100, and 4 and 96 are 100. So every time I go up here and down on this side, I get another 100. How many of those pairs will there be? And the audience screams out! 49. 49 pairs, right? And then, But there are 50, because the, there's the 100 up on top you haven't added in yet. And then there's 50 left over in the middle. So the answer is 5,050, right? Got to be. And are you certain of that? Well, yeah. And it's because you're thinking about the problem mathematically instead of arith arithmetically. And that's when kids start to really grok the power of math. And it's not just, it's not just uh, addition. And so one time I did this, and there was this girl who I said, OK, now instead of 1 to 100, let's do 1 to any number. And I started to work that out. And this girl um, wrote down an equation on a piece of paper. And I said, okay, so if this is the case, then what would be the answer to 1 to 137? She looks down, gives me the correct answer. She did this three times. And when I looked at her equation, I didn't have, I just glanced at it because I didn't have a lot of time. I didn't recognize it immediately. 
I said, okay, let's talk about it afterwards. And then I look at her equation and realize she had written the correct answer, but in a different form. She had intuited the answer. And when I asked her how she did it, she said, well, you know, I figured there is, well, if you take the number that's in the middle, there are going to be as many numbers on this side as there are on that side. So if I add those up and I, and I, I take the average, then I should get something like n over 2 times the average. And she very quickly came up with the right answer. <laughs> Just intuitive. Okay, and so, you know, when I saw her do that, I said, how long have you known that you were a math genius? And she couldn't do her multiplication tables, neither can I, and she thought that she was, therefore, a math idiot. And so I had a math professor, a woman math professor, write her a letter congratulating her on her discovery and encouraging her to pursue her studies. And so the little, it's very important to be able to recognize when somebody's done something original and then be able to reward them because she was actually very, very good at something she always thought she was not very good at. So, any other questions? Did I? Sir? We have piloted. We've been piloting it in various venues for the last seven years. So we have we've heard, uh, about 100 kids have gone through the program for five to six months at a time. We have real experience with them. We've done a lot of things to we like, for instance, removed the social elements and just ran it as a social club and done a lot of other changes, swapping things in and out to try to see what works. And it's based on that experimental evidence that we think we know how to solve the problem. And this is a key aspect for this program. How do you how do you evaluate how do you evaluate the program? Uh, we evaluate the program. There are a number of different metrics. Uh, the simplest one is basically the, the parents' view of the changes in their kids and the kids' view of their, cha of their changes in themselves. That's, that's the easiest metric to measure. And then there are a number of other metrics that you, that you measure as well about their cognitive reasoning skills, their problem solving skills, and, and so forth. And we think we know how to solve the problem. And retention is very important because the Girl Scouts have a science program that 50% uh, of the kids drop out of at the end of the first week, and only 3% of them are still taking part in the same year, uh, at the end of the year. Well, we had a group of 14 kids, which isn't a huge sample, but we ran it for six months, and at the end of that time, we had 100% retention. And the parents were paying to keep the kids in the program. So, I mean, we're not gonna have 100% retention all the time, but that suggests that the retention of our program is greater than are certainly competitive with those of other programs like the ones that are in the United States. So, so if it's not top secret, what is it that you're doing that makes it so different? I mean, I, I saw a few of the slides, but that, I mean, we, a little bit on if you add, well, we do a lot of all the things that we're saying. We create a strong emotional, uh, emo, we create a strong group that is emotionally bonded to each other so that, that they keep coming back because of the experience. I don't care so much if they learn something every week, I care that they had a great time while they were there. Because I realized that I got years to get them fully trained, right? And so, you know, we're all about creating a wonderful learning experience where they actually gain self-confidence, build their self-esteem, and, you know, uh, gain leadership abilities, and see themselves advancing as, as people. That's essentially, in a, nut in a nutshell, what we do. David. So what, I, what I'm wondering, I guess what, what I'm wondering right now is um, how do you uh, bring people into the program who wouldn't otherwise already be interested in science? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it's, it, it's a great question. Um, our approach is like that of light beer, how they, how they marketed light beer. Um, when light beer was first marketed, nobody wanted it, okay? And so uh, what they did was the, uh, the company, I think it was, uh, I, I've forgotten which, which company it was, brewing company that came up with it. But they were making a ton of money from their other beer products. And so they knew that eventually this could have real legs, but you had to get over the initial hump of resistance to the product. And so um, they brought in all these celebrities playing pool and doing all the rest of the stuff, and they had this huge campaign, and they stayed with it until light beer took off, and now it's, uh, what, 40% of the sales? 
Okay, and so what we are doing is instead of what the National Science Foundation typically does, is they say, we're going to give you money to create a program, but right out of the bat, right, right out of the door, you've got to go into underprivileged communities and you've got to make this work there. And in T minus three years, the funding goes away. Okay? So what happens is you go and you can have great results with those kids for three years. But when the funding goes away, there isn't enough traction yet for that program in the community for the community to really come together and give you the money that you need to keep that program going. And so almost all of the nationally science, uh, the nationally fund, the program that the National Science Foundation funds evaporate as soon as the funding goes away. So what I want to do is sell lab rats to our natural subscribers, to the people who have the money, realize the value, and are willing to pay for the privilege of having their kids in our program. And then when we have a constant revenue stream, then we go and start dumping those resources like Robin Hood from the rich to the poor, a steady flow of sustainable resources so that we'll be able to keep that program going even if it takes a while for it to, to pick up. Uh, also, we're hoping that when we, as we've, we've talked to the, the boys and girls clubs, we've hope, we're hoping that, that they'll live up to the discussions that we had earlier, that when we prove the program really works very well for them, they will help us bring it nationally to their community um, through their programs. And I think that those two approaches together are very likely to be able to get us uh, to do a lot of great things for the kids who most, most need it. But it has to be done with your understanding of the marketplace. Because if you don't know where your money is coming from and you're going to go, you know, and you're, you're living on a hope and a prayer, you will go out of business. So, okay, last question. Everybody should applaud the fact that it's the last question. You've been very patient sitting right here, sir. Uh, got a lot of questions um, for, for adult science evangelists. Yeah. Have, right now, we have hundreds of thousands of scientists that have graduated from college. And why are we, why are Americans so sheepish about talking about science at home? And so we have such resistance and skepticism about science. I'm not sure. That the premise is correct. What do you? Maybe you can. Why, why, why is there such a resistance to scientific issues? Yeah. You have to give me an example because I, I don't see that. Climate change. Well, that's the climate change specifically. Everyone did agree with it, and then we had a scandal which allowed the other side to come up and make it into a political issue and beat back, and then you know everybody loves the underdog, and when one side's been put down for a long time, and suddenly they have a victory, everybody goes, oh, all sorts of, oh, it's not quite the same as saying we're not talking about science in the homes. I mean, the reason why, I mean, a lot of scientists go out into the community and they try to get kids, uh, kids excited about science, and frankly, they're a dismal failure. Okay, and it's not because they don't have the heart, and it's not because they don't have great presentations. Some of these guys knock your socks off when they go into a classroom. They just do a fabulous job. But the problem is, they're a one-time show. They walk in, and they get the kids super jacked up. Oh, yes, we want to study science. This is really great. And then the kids go home to the same environment they were with, with the same neighbors, the same neighbor kids, the same you know, viewpoints that their parents have, da 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 da. And I guarantee you, the inertia of that home situation is gonna overcome whatever momentum you give those kids out the door from a single presentation. That's why if you wanna make a change, you can't just go out and give a one-time shot. You have to be part of something that's gonna be involved with these kids' lives continuously throughout their teenage years to have a chance of having a long-term you know, long involvement. So if they were to become mentors or become merit badge counselors for the Lab Rats program, that would be a way in which they could contribute in, and uh, as part of something that would be ongoing. So anyway, that's my show. Thank you very much. I do will take one final round of applause. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not proud. Yeah, you guys have been, have been a great audience. Uh, I, uh, I hoped I informed your thinking. Keep your eyes. Very good. A lot, a lot of times when I'm talking to people, they look up at me just like that. And if you do that, I'm going to fool you. Don't look up at me. Keep your eyes on the ball. Are you ready? One last time. One, two, three. Blow. Has it disappeared yet?
Do you know why it hasn't disappeared? Because it's too big now. Watch, blow. Can I have a big hand of applause, big round of applause for David? Very good. Very good. Are we up? Aha, I distracted you long enough. Now the question is, can I go through my slides? Yes! OK, we're done. We're set. His first career was as a, magi a magician. He, from the age of 16 to 18, he earned his living as a street magician, doing mainly a trick called Three Card Monty. Well, Three Card Monty was one of the things. One I did. Of the three Card Monty is illegal gambling. I'm not supposed to talk about that. <laughs> I did do that. I did a lot of things in the streets that I'm not supposed to talk about anymore. But uh, no, it was uh, 18 until about uh, 21. I made my living as a street magician. So after that, he was undergraduate at UCLA. Berkeley. Berkeley. And got his PhD at? Uh, UCLA. Sure that we do. You know, every single thing that we do is all about making sure you're not fooling yourself. So in order to appreciate just how easy it is to be fooled, I teach all my kids how to do a little bit of magic. Okay, so I need a volunteer, hopefully uh, somebody, a good sport, okay? Not somebody who's gonna give me a bunch of trouble tonight, but a good sport, somebody who's willing to work with me and have fun with me. You, sir, yes, would you please stand right up? Can I have a big round of applause? That's the most credit you got for the least amount of work you've ever done in your life. What's your name? David. David, do me a favor. Sit down right here, David. OK? And you're going to need to hang on to this. Now, I'm going to show you a classic of magic. Uh, it's, uh, it was originally invented by a vaudevillian made Slide named Slidini. Every magician knows this trick. This is the quintessential example demonstration of, of misdirection. OK? Every single one of you will see exactly what I am doing. Everyone will see. So don't you know, suddenly scream out an answer or something. Yes, you're all going to see. The only person in the audience who, here tonight who will not see is this gentleman right here. And you're going to sit there and you're going to say, what? Is he stupid or something? Right? That will be your reaction. You may laugh. But don't point. And do thank your lucky stars you don't happen to be sitting right here in this chair. Hey, David, how you doing? Right. We're going to do a little eye test for you. What I want you to do, I'm going to take, roll this up into a ball. And what I want you to do is see if you can watch the ball very, very carefully. Don't take your eyes off the ball. Oh, yes, that's very good. Now, what I want you to do is see if you can tell which hand I put the ball in. OK? Watch. One, two. Which hand is the ball? No, 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 no. You're not watching very close. Well, let's try it one more time. Watch. One, two, three. Which hand is the ball? This one. <laughs> okay, okay. Two out of three. You ready? One last time. Now, which hand is the ball? Today would be nice. Neither. Which hand is the ball? Which one? There, da, da. Uh, and no, no, actually, you, you were right the first time. It was neither. Let's try this one more time. Okay, now we're going to do that again in slow motion, all right? What I want you to do is one, two, three, blow. No, 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 you're not blowing hard enough. One more time. Blow really hard. And just that fast, oh, it disappears. <laughs> now I'm going to do this in super slow motion. You ready? Watch. Take the ball, place it right there. Now watch. One, two, three. Just that fast. <laughs> Disappears. Now one last time here. Now I'm going to take a really big ball. An absolutely enormous ball. A ball of paper so large I can't even hold it in my hand completely without him seeing it. 
Are you ready? Now I want, I'll see if I can make this, this, this ball disappear. That's right. Why don't I just entertain the crowd for a couple minutes while we try to work through all this. Okay guys, my name is Sean Carlson. Uh, I uh, am going to be talking to you about how you can use immersions to hopefully solve the science literacy crisis in America. I'm going to start all this again for the benefits of the people who are going to be watching on video at some point in the future. So I'm doing something sort of in advance that is kind of on topic and is fun. Uh, one of the things that we do that I'll be talking about is ways that you can inspire kids to love learning about science by using the, basically the right sales pitch about science to describe science in language that they really understand that speaks to their immediate self-interest. And so I'm going to give you a couple of examples, but the one I want to talk about today is how we talk about what science is, or what is, what is doing science all about. And we tell kids that doing science is all about making sure you're not fooling yourself. I mean, if you want to have a message that the kids can understand very, very clearly, doing science is all about systematic investigations using experimental methods and falsifiability, but right now, that passes them in both lanes. You want language that's clear and compelling that they understand. Tell them it's all about making sure you're not fooling yourself. Now, I made my living as a professional magician for years. And so what I want to do is I want to do, show you a demonstration of why it's so important. Why do we do uh, systematic observations, right? Because we know that if we don't, something's going to come in and screw up the results and we're going to fool ourselves. Why do we use uh, double-blind controls? Why do we use mathematics to the, to the level and regard? <laughs> We haven't rehearsed this, can you tell? We <laughs> <laughs> did a postdoc at Berkeley for a couple of years and decided, in part because he and his uh, PhD postdoc supervisor did not see totally eye to eye on what Sean should be doing. And Sean then decided to launch himself on a new career becoming engaged with science education. He had an absolutely spectacular idea of organizing the tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, people in the US who wanted to be citizen scientists, who wanted to be capable of doing experiments on their own, in teams, whatever, connect to one another, he formed the Society for Amateur Scientists, right? Yes! I'm doing all of this from memory, as you can tell. He formed the science, and this was a major emerging institution. It's very much alive today. It's all due to Sean, and this extraordinary development in the field of science education was recognized by the MacArthur people who gave him one of their genius awards. Uh, not content to rest on his laurels, Sean then took on an even harder problem of 